Well, thanks for inviting me to the TISIC talks, and I'm very happy to talk about uh, some of the recent findings on challenges of active perception. So what is active perception? Uh, let me start with an example. So multi-sensor networks are everywhere nowadays. Um, if we walk in a public space, it's common to assume that we are being monitored by a multi-camera surveillance system. A key challenge in design of such system is efficient allocation of scarce resources, for example, computational power. So in many cases, it is not possible to process the signal collected by all the sensors or in case of multi-camera systems to apply sophisticated object detection algorithms <clears throat> on images collected from all the cameras. In fact, in many cases, even if there is only a single camera, as I show on the image on the right, even then it is not possible to apply object detection algorithm on all locations that are covered in the image captured by this one single camera. So this resource allocation gives rise to sensor selection problem where an agent must select a subset of sensors that it should allocate the scarce, the scarce resources to. Sensor selection is an example of an active perception task where an agent must take actions to reduce its uncertainty about its environment while reasoning about its limitation and the limitations imposed on it by the environment. And in general, active perception encompass a broad spectrum of concepts <clears throat> with multiple applications such as visual attention, control of memory, active sensing, sensor selection, or even question answering system where an agent must ask a series of questions and then get answers to them and then stitch those answers together to come up to a final conclusion. So what are the common characteristics or challenges that are associated with this task? So first, this is a sequential decision-making task where the agent is, or the final aim of the agent is to compute a policy, which is a sequence of action. The agent should be able to model the stochasticity and partial observ observability in the environment that it is acting in. Furthermore, it should be able to reason long-term that is, it should be able to reason about the consequences of the action that it takes right now in the future. In order to compare between what might be a good action and what not, it should be able to associate an objective value to its estimate of uncertainty or information. Fine. Finally, in many cases, the action space of the agent is, it, is in itself is a subset of uh, available set of sensors. So the agent must be able to deal with a combinatorial action space where if the number of sensors increases, the number of options that the agent has to select from also increases combinatorially. And finally, it may be desired that the agent must learn from its past mistakes. So maybe the agent should also have the capability of learning to perceive actively. We address these challenges using at least a combination of four different approaches, decision theoretic planning, information theory, submodularity, and reinforcement learning a few of which I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. So how do we model the world in order to capture the stochasticity and partial observability? Partially observable Markov decision process provide a decision theoretic framework to do so. In a POMDP model of the world, an agent maintains a belief at every time step about the world that it is trying to observe. And depending on this belief, the agent takes an action and the world keeps evolving in according to a particular dynamics. As the agent takes an action, it receives a partial observation about what is going on in the world. And using this information, it maintains a belief or it updates its belief about what is currently going on in the world. In general, the observation is correlated with the true state of the world. The idea is using this model of the world, the agent can compute long-term policies that tells the agent what might be an informative action and what might what might not be. Or in general, the agent can use this model of the world to compute a policy that can maximize a long-term notion of reward. In case of active perception, this reward is defined as the information gain of an agent, which is an objective way to measure information that has its roots in the information theory. However, we also talked about another challenge where the action space of the agent itself is combinatorial. So while the, action can, while the agent can select a sequence of action, each action in itself can be a tedious task in itself. So how do we tackle that? So we tackle that by exploiting the property of submodularity. Submodularity formalizes the notion of diminishing returns. 
What it means, loosely speaking, is that as I add more and more element to a set, the value of a function of that set it starts to decrease as more and more elements are added. And maybe I can explain that better with this example image on the right. So here I have a smaller subset of the yellow sensor and I have a bigger subset of yellow and purple sensor. And to both of them, I add the blue sensor. The increase caused by the addition of the blue sensor to the smaller subset here is clearly greater than the increase caused in the area covered by the addition of the blue sensor to the bigger sensor due to the overlap. And this basically is an illustration of the property of submodularity. And why this property is useful or helpful is because if a function is submodular, then we can use greedy maximization instead of an exact maximization. And greedy maximization is computationally very cheaper than a full maximization. Now, fortunately for us, information gain is submodular. So we can now directly apply submodularity and a planning method based on form DPs to compute a policy. Just as a side note, submodularity in general is a very useful property and it has applications in image, text, data summarization. And in fact, uh, recently, a couple of my students used it to do grocery list planning for their master thesis. So here's an example of the algorithm we developed using the POMDP formulation and submodularity. And here's a small demo of this algorithm. So what you see here is that the agent is trying to select 40 out of 5,000 pixel boxes that are possible in this image. And it is trying to do so in really quick time, but also to track the five blue dots, which actually represent people in this scene. And it does so, so that the red boxes track the people, but also so that it also looks for new people that may appear in this scene. So as you can see, the selections are made really quickly and the agent is able to actually track these people. Quantitatively speaking, we showed that uh, we can actually maintain 80% of 10% of the resources. So here, selecting 40 items out of 5,000 is already a really big number, and we were able to achieve it in let's say milliseconds. So on the x-axis, you see the time taken to compute a solution, and on y-axis, you see the total performance of this algorithm. And the flat line saying BD performance means brute force detection, which means the performance of the algorithm that would have resulted if we had applied the detector on all possible locations in this image. And the blue dots here are the party maxed algorithm that I represented. And ideally, we want the blue dots to be as far left, uh, left top as possible. Okay, so in that case, the final challenge that I talked about, which is learning. So recently, we also proposed a deep RL based method for solving the POM DP that we formulated. And it, called, and it is called as deep anticipatory network. And our idea here is to use deep reinforcement learning methods to directly learn what might be a good or bad policy without having to uh, model the world. So here, deep anticipatory networks or DAN consists of two neural networks. One is called as Q network and the other is called as M network. The role of the Q network is to take actions and collect observations. So for example, it can select a camera and then the observation from that camera is collected. This observation and action is passed to the M network whose job is to actually predict what is going on in the world. And as time goes on, the Q network collects more and more observations and M network is trained to, be to make its prediction better and better. And if the M network correctly predicts what is going on, then the Q network in turn is rewarded. And ideally, both of them are actually trying to accomplish a joint task. And um, they are able to actually help each other or improve each other's behavior. And we finally show that the Q agent or the Q network here is able to learn to select observations that are most useful or most relevant for the M network to predict the hidden state of the world. We applied this algorithm on a multi-person uh, tracking system. And here in green, we show our algorithm, which is DAN, and we compare it uh, to coverage and random uh, selection. And in this case, these both baselines are quite strong. So actually random in this case would correspond to any machine learning system that we see nowadays where a data is sampled randomly or IID. So um, that is already a very strong baseline. And we, and, and we show that um, DAN actually outperforms them uh, by a bit. 
Also, we compare it to a coverage base baseline. The idea behind which is to try to cover as many people as possible. So select cameras that cover as many people as possible. And why it does not necessarily perform the best is because in many cases, we don't even need to have an observation to find out where people are and there for a very long time. It's better to rather look at a more uh, dynamic place where people, where there is a constant crowd of moving people. And then is able to exploit such uh, insights. Finally, we also apply it on an MNIST object detection task. And here on the right, I show the glimpses that are selected by the algorithm in order to predict what is the underlying behavior in two separate instances. And you can already see that the algorithm it starts to select glimpses that turn out to be more informative so that it can predict what the underlying widget. So here, I would like to draw a conclusion to my, toss, uh, to my talk. What I tried to present was an introduction to active perception and the challenges associated with it. I also tried to pre uh, present a planning and learning algorithm that addresses some of those challenges. <clears throat> However, I also think that it raises more questions than answers as in, um, I presented result on sensor selection task, but what about navigation? What if we have a mobile robot? And what if uh, having that mobility violate the property of submodularity? So how can we answer questions like those? How can an agent help um, its navigation with active perception and can learning to navigate or knowing better na navigation help an, uh, help an agent perceive its environment more better? That's again something that uh, introduces a cyclic structure and a question that I haven't answered particularly in this talk, but there are answers to this question in a specific setting. It would be nice to know if there are general answers to this. Finally, what can we say about reinforcement learning? Uh, does active perception present a harder or easier set of problems for RL? And what about the sample efficiency? So I would like to draw end to my talk here with these questions 